invite your attention to God's Word as it is recorded for us in the letter of Paul to the church at Philippi, Philippians 3. And uh, we will begin reading verse uh, 7 and f verses following down through 14. Philippians 3. 7 through 14, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Louisa Fletcher has written a wonderful poem. It is called The Land of beginning again. Louisa knew great pain in her life and great disappointments. She wrote this poem in 1922. Her husband was the winning Pulitzer Prize author Booth Tarkington. They were married in 1902, but unfortunately Booth was an alcoholic. They struggled through their marriage for the next nine years until she divorced him in 1911. Through their marriage, they had a child, a daughter that had been born in 1906, but died at the age of 16 in 1922. She had known much sadness in her life. But she wrote this poem shortly after the daughter's death. I wish there were some wonderful place in the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. I wish we could come on it all unaware like the hunter who finds a lost trail. And I wish that the one whom our blindness had done the greatest injustice of all could be there at the gates like an old friend that waits for the comrade he's gladdest to hail. We would find all the things we intended to do, but forgot and remembered too late. Little praises unspoken, 
little promises broken, and all the thousand and one little duties neglected that might have perfected the day for one less fortunate. It wouldn't be possible not to be kind in the land of beginning again. And the ones we misjudged and the ones whom we grudged, their moments of victory here would find in the grasp of our loving hand clasp more penitent, more than penitent lips could explain. So I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. Isn't that a wonderful poem? I would like to speak to the nature of beginning again, of recalculating our life. Every year at this time, don't we do some recalculating? We, we look at our lives and say, well, how can I make this year a little bit better than the previous years. And, and we go through a time of sadness and joy, somewhat sadness as we say goodbye to the years of the past and happiness and joy as we anticipate 2019. You know, some people would say, the key to great success in 2019 is greater knowledge. And so they'll go by bookstores and find the self-improvement section and, uh, and they'll uh, find that perfect book that's going to be their solution for 2019. And maybe others will even enroll in a class at the community college or online. But then still others will argue that the real key for success in 2019 and for celebrating this gift of beginning again is discipline. It is found in the discipline of setting some resolutions and standing by those resolutions. As one fellow has said, may all of your troubles last as long as your resolutions. Hmm. You know, I will discipline my eating habits. I won't ask for a show of hands on anyone who feels conviction at this time, but I will discipline my eating habits. I'm, I'm there. Hmm. I'll get more exercise. I'm there. I'll join a health club. In fact, it's always fun to drive by Planet Fitness in Fort Oglethorpe. January through February, there's no parking space in the parking lot. But then sometime around the end of February, the early part of March, things just kind of level out. For some strange reason, all of those that were there first thing in the morning are no longer there. You know, maybe I'll get more sleep, uh, more sleep. I'll go to bed before midnight. And some may even resolve to make some social changes, such as, you know, I'll get on Facebook a little bit more, or I'll get off of Facebook a little bit more, depending upon what your need is. Some will probably resolve to serve more. I'll be more active in terms of my volunteer work. Uh, you know, I'll share more, I'll give more to charitable ministries, more to my church. Uh, I think all of us agree that our, in lives, that our lives are enriched by knowledge, by discipline, by service, by generosity, and even by organization. Boy, that's one for me, too. I'll get more organized in 2019. And certainly we can all agree that there is much room for improvement. Yeah. There are not too many Mary Poppins in our audience that are practically perfect in every way. You know. 
We all have room for improvement. But however, we also admit that just making physical changes without making heart changes is like having a car that's hard to crank, it misses, and has stripped gears. So we take it to the body shop, we get a lot of body work done, new tires, and an expensive paint job. Otherwise, you know, we're like the Pharisees Jesus described as whitewashed tombs are pristine on the outside, but the inside is full of death. Or as one good old boy put it, uh, changing the outside without changing the inside is like putting lipstick on a warthog. Pucker up, baby. We need change in our lives, but we need the right kind of changes, obviously. So let's take a moment to listen to the advice of St. Paul. And I believe we'll gain some real insight into the change that should take place in our minds and our hearts if we're going to see that this gift of beginning again is used for its best purpose. First of all, let's look at the matter of perfection. Paul is not claiming to be perfect. In fact, he lets us know, hey guys, I haven't grasped it all. I don't have it all down. I don't have a, a hold of what I need to, to have a handle on. That's what that word means to apprehend or grasp. And he's not claiming that he has perfection, but he is claiming that he has a plan and we can look at that plan and then we can also be attracted to the fact that he is striving toward a goal, which is a prize. So if we got a few takeaways this morning, I want you to think about those three. The perfection, the plan, and the prize. You know, perfection was something that had eluded Paul his whole life. From childhood to early adulthood, he had pursued the path of perfection, not satisfied with merely being religious and being consider considered an observer of Jewish customs, being even so strident in his religious beliefs that he became a Pharisee, meticulous in all the law, but as a young man, that wasn't enough. Not only did he have to be perfect, he had to make everybody perfect around him. Now, if you want to have a wonderful time in 2019, strive to make that one of your resolutions. But he had a problem with perfection to start with, and then he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, and God got his attention through this tremendous revelation of God's love for him and of this experience of salvation that changed his life. You know, he had a problem with perfection, but he learned that there were things that he needed to do in his own life to grow in his awareness of the call of God on his life. Now, he was not satisfied with the mere uh, fact that he came from some kind of great heritage. He said, all of these things that a lot of people would prize, my uh, heritage, uh, my uh, pedigree, he said, I count that as nothing. I count that as nothing. And as I read to you in the authorized version, the King James, the King James Version, that it's pretty strong language he used when he said he didn't just use the word nothing. And he said, I would count those as nothing because he said, I have a plan. I forget those things which are behind me and I press on to those things which are before me because what I'm pressing on to is the prize of the mark 
of the excellency of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus, that calling that I have on my life, and that calling that you also have on your life. So as we understand Paul's problem with perfection, we also understand that he had a very good plan, and that was not to be looking backward at all his accomplishments, but to be looking forward at the challenges that were before him. And in order to do that, he said, I stay focused. He said, this one thing I do as part of his plan. This one thing I do. You know, when a word is used only one time in a work, whether it be a novel or it be the Bible, it is called an apoxylagomenon. It is very rare to see a word like that. It is the only time you see that word in the entire work. And this is that. He is saying, this is the one thing I do. I strive for this one goal. This is the one prize that is before me. I have this one plan. So Paul admitted he wasn't all that. He realized that he had a long way to go, but he had a plan for getting there. So I would challenge you as we look at our lives and we say, gee, I've got a long way to go. There's a lot to be done that we have a plan. And that was Paul's plan. This one thing I do, he said, I make it my priority. I don't look behind me, but I look straight ahead. I forget what is behind me. I focus on what is ahead of me. I look forward. But not only does he look forward, he uses a term that comes from a track star who, as he sees the goal before him, as he sees the ribbon stretch before him, he stretches into it, leaning as hard as he can, except not very good advice for senior Olympics, <laughs> as I found out. Even though I was a sprinter in college, that was a long time ago. And a few years ago, I got in uh, participating in senior Olympics, and I was stretching for the mark. and. I kept stretching and kept going and kept tumbling when I finally hit the, hit the turf there, you know. They, they were bringing out everybody, thinking he'd kill himself, you know, but no, it was fine. But anyway, that, that is that striving, that is that stretching. In other words, he's making the utmost effort because he is focused on the future. Jesus said, no man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is worthy of the plow. And one of the reasons is because if you're looking back, you can't put your full energy into looking forward. So I guess the good advice for Paul would be to say, yes, let's learn from our past, but let us not be paralyzed by it because we are still looking back. Let's continue to look forward. This one thing I do. I like uh, the writing of Bob Buford. He wrote a lot about uh, midlife and the midlife crisis that he was having. And he was a very successful businessman. But he said he wanted to make the most of his life and the time that he had remaining, whatever the Lord had for him. And so he hired a business consultant. Bob Buford is a very dedicated Christian, and his business consultant was a man he greatly loved and trusted uh, because he was very sound in business, uh, and he himself was Jewish, the consultant. Now, what that consultant told Bob was very telling. Bob told him all that he had done, some of the things he hoped to do. And he said, so how can I best make a commitment for the future? And the man said, well, 
He said, I want you to take a blank sheet of paper, and he said, I want you to draw a little box. And he said, I want you to put in that box what's important to you. And that will determine where you will be focused for the rest of your life. If money, fame, power is important to you, then put that in the box. Family, travel, recreation, or Jesus. Bob said, I had to think about that a little bit. Here was a, a Jewish friend asking me that I want to put Jesus in the box. And he said, I realized that that's what I was going to do. And so he backed away from a lot of his business pursuits. He did not just sell them. He lets other people manage them. But he spends most of his time now traveling all over the world telling people about Jesus, writing books that touch hearts and bless lives. So if I had to ask you what's in the box, what would your answer be? That's what it means to not just say glibly, poetically, I focus on the prize ahead of me. I strive for that prize. I stretch for that prize. But what is that prize? Paul said it is for the excellency of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. So have you set any goals for 2019? Do you have a plan for reaching them? Keep focused, keep forgetting the past, keep forward looking. You'll reach those goals. And if you don't, you will one day when you're summoned upward to receive the ultimate prize.